Testament scholar Bart Ehrman says that the author of Acts didn't know the Apostle Paul, so what we read about in Acts 13 through 28 is more about Luke spinning a good yarn than actually reporting real history. Ehrman writes, the author of Acts is simply claiming to be a traveling companion of Paul's and therefore unusually well suited to give a true account of Paul's message and mission, but he almost certainly was not a companion of Paul's. On the one hand, he was writing long after Paul and his companions were dead. Scholars usually date Acts to around 85 CE or so, over two decades after Paul's death. On the other hand, he seems to be far too poorly informed about Paul's theology and missionary activities to have been someone with first-hand knowledge. For someone writing long after Paul was dead and unfamiliar with Paul's missionary activities, the author of Acts gets a ridiculous amount of difficult facts correct regarding local places, titles, names, environmental conditions, customs, and circumstances. Classical historian Colin Hammer details 84 of these facts in his book, The Book of Acts in the Setting of Hellenistic History. Wouldn't these details be best explained by him being a traveling companion of Paul? Allow me to give you a handful of instances of the titles of local officials that Luke effortlessly gets right. Luke gets the proper designation for the magistrates of the colony of Stratagoi in Acts 16.22, following the general term Archontes in verse 19. He gets the proper term Politarchs uses the magistrates in Thessalonica. The term Areopagites is the correct title for members in the court of Athens that he gets correct. He also correctly identifies Gallio as the proconsul resident in Corinth, an allusion that lets us date the events to the summer of AD 51 to the spring of 52, since that is when Gallio served as proconsul council of Achaia. Luke also gets the correct title Grammatos for the chief executive magistrate in Ephesus found in many inscriptions there. Furthermore, when Luke tells us of the riot in Ephesus, he indicates that the city clerk told the crowd that there are proconsuls. Proconsul is a Roman authority to whom one might take a complaint. Normally, there was only one. So why does Luke casually use the plural term anthropotoi here? Turns out, just at that particular time, there was in fact two of the result of the assassination by poisoning in the fall of 54 AD of the previous proconsul Salanus. This again is something that would be rather difficult for Luke to get right by fluke. The author of Acts also gets right numerous points of geography, sea routes, and landmarks. For example, he names the proper port Perga for the ship crossing from Cyprus. We see this in Acts 13.13. 13. Luke also gets another proper port, Atalia, the returning travelers would use. Luke also correctly names the place of a sailor's landmark, Samothrace. And he also gets the correct implication that sea travel is the most convenient way of reaching Athens with the favoring Atesian winds of the summer sailing season. Luke also nails it when it comes to local customs and beliefs. Luke knows that two gods were known to be associated with Lystra, Zeus and Hermes. These are paralleled epigraphically from Lystra itself, and the grouping of the names of Greek divinities is a peculiarly characteristic of the Lystra district. Luke also uses the correct local Athenian slang word for Paul, spermologos, or seed picker, as well as the Areopagus, which is the hill of Ares. Luke also gets correctly the shrines and images of Artemis that would have been seen in Ephesus. Terracotta images of Artemis, aka Diana, abound in the archaeological evidence. Luke also correctly gets that there would be an altar to an unknown god. Such altars are mentioned by Pisanias and Diogenes. Note the aptness of Paul's reference to the temples made with hands. Considering that Paul was speaking in a location dominated by the Parthenon and surrounded by other shrines of the finest classical art, Luke also gets the proper title Neocoros, commonly authorized by the Romans for major cities that possessed an official temple of the imperial cult, and I could go on and on. This ultra-specific and detailed knowledge shown in the book of Acts indicates its author was close up to the facts, well-informed, and habitually reliable. So what does Ehrman have to say in response to this kind of argument? Well, he tells us on his blog. He writes, if you can show that the account knows where certain places actually were, and knows details about what were in those places and landmarks and so on, doesn't that show that the author must have been with Paul on his journeys? Uh, why would it show that? Wouldn't it just show that he knew about the these locations and what was in them? Wouldn't you get precisely the same kind of narrative if this was someone who had traveled a good bit himself, or knew others that had, and pieced it all together? Ehrman goes on to illustrate his point with an analogy. He writes, Suppose in 2000 years someone uncovers a story that describes an event that happened to Professor Bart Ehrman in March of 2016. Professor Ehrman taught at the University of North Carolina, which was located in a college town named Chapel Hill. That semester he was teaching his course on the New Testament in a large lecture classroom in a building called Hamilton. Hall. On the afternoon of March 14, Professor was just leaving his office in Carolina Hall to take a three-minute walk to his classroom when he suddenly heard a massive explosion, and going out of his building he saw that Hamilton Hall had been destroyed by an explosion, killing 172 people. Later investigators discovered that it had been caused by a gas leak. Now this future researcher who had uncovered this story decides to look into the archaeological record to see if the account is accurate. He learns that way back then, 
there really was a state called North Carolina and sees that archaeologists had really uncovered a town called Chapel Hill where there really was a university. More than that, they had excavated the university and found Carolina Hall and, miracle of miracles, there was an actual map of the campus in the ruins. It turns out that one of the major lecture rooms for the large classes was a short distance away within eyesight in Hamilton Hall, just as in the story. Moreover, the records of all the professors from the 21st century were discovered, and there was a fellow named Bart Ehrman who really did teach courses on something called the New Testament and was teaching one such course in spring semester 2016. Bingo! This story must have been written by somebody who is a companion of Bart Ehrman who was there to see all these things. How else could he have all this information about North Carolina, Chapel Hill, University, Hamilton Hall, Carolina Hall, Bart Ehrman, and a class on the New Testament that particular semester. And that means Hamilton Hall really was destroyed by an explosion caused by a gas leak, right? Um, well, no. Millions of people know about North Carolina, the existence of Chapel Hill, and that there is a university there. Hundreds of thousands know about both Carolina Hall and Hamilton Hall, and have a general sense of their proximity, and that some fellow named Bart Ehrman teaches New Testament there. Why would the account of the gas leak explosion have been written by someone who was there at the time, or even someone who knew me, or someone who observed the event? Well, I have to say, this is actually quite astonishing. For starters, according to Ehrman, no amount of detailed confirmation is allowed to count in favor of the reliability of the narrative because it could all just be common knowledge. But the argument here is that Luke gets hard things correct, things too difficult to be written off as mere common knowledge. This is something that Ehrman has failed to appreciate. Also, it seems to me that Bart can't have it both ways here. If getting historical details wrong is evidence against the historical trustworthiness of Acts, then getting them right is evidence for it. To give just one example, Ehrman is is often argued that Luke is a sloppy historian because he supposedly botches the details of the census of Quirinius. And in making his case against the reliability of Acts, he references Paul's letters, saying Acts contradicts them in numerous ways. I've said why I believe he's wrong about that in previous videos, but this would seem to suggest that Acts isn't highly realistic fiction, since in Ehrman's view, Acts contradicts the main sources for Paul's life. If the author of Acts went to the trouble of visiting all these places that he claims Paul traveled to, gathering highly specific information to use them for his realistic historical novel of Paul's travels, then why in the world would he also contradict the Pauline epistles which were in wide circulation and much more readily available? Furthermore, Ehrman also seems to be committing what philosopher Tim McGrew has dubbed the Wikipedia fallacy. It's not as if Luke could have easily looked these facts up like we can today. Obviously, Acts wasn't written in the age of Wikipedia and Google. There's a huge difference between Acts and the future scenario Ehrman describes. Furthermore, all these facts can't just be chalked up to mere common knowledge knowledge that Luke would have picked up at the local library. Is Bart honestly really suggesting that the author of Acts traveled around to all these same places, or at the very least interviewed people who had been there, and included these super specific facts in an account of historical fiction, a literary genre that didn't even exist yet? If so, that would be incredibly anachronistic and ad hoc. I'm afraid that Ehrman is accusing the eminent classical historian Colin Hammer of the old internet atheist canard, the Spider-Man fallacy. This is a surprising move coming from a well-known scholar like Ehrman. The ever-reliable and usually offbeat Urban Dictionary defines the Spider-Man fallacy like this, often used to illustrate the flaw in the assertion by evangelical Christians that archaeologists unearthing biblical cities today proves that the Bible was written by a supernatural force. The Spider-Man fallacy is committed any time the discovery of a mundane element from a myth, legend, or story is taken to mean that all of the parts of that story, even the supernatural, are also true. Maybe Ehrman hasn't quite stooped to that level, but this argument is pretty close. If Bart happens to watch this, let me be real clear. Dr. Ehrman, no one here is arguing that this evidence proves with 100% certainty that Luke was an eyewitness and a traveling companion of Paul, and that makes everything that he says and acts automatically true, including all of the miracles. Rather, with this demonstrated meticulousness and detailed accuracy as a historian, it is apparent that Luke is highly knowledgeable, well-informed, and often very dependable. This is better explained by him being Luke's traveling companion and an eyewitness than the hypothesis that he wrote historical fiction or was deliberately duping his audience. He's not a schizophrenic author, being very meticulous and detailed at one moment, and then free to embellish out of whole cloth at another moment. Hammer and other apologists and Christians using his findings are making a probabilistic argument. Luke's track record of accurate reporting gives us some reason to trust him on matters which cannot be directly cross-checked, such as miracle reports. It doesn't prove that miracles occur, but rather that he describes what the disciples testified to have witnessed. But Ehrman just doesn't see that. He sees contradictions, often where there are none, as I discussed in this video. And he calls relevant evidence irrelevant by playing the Spider-Man fallacy card. I'm afraid that Ehrman's bias is really showing here.